Welcome to Independent Sources. I'm Gary Pierre Pierre. Over the last week, Barack Obama's inaugural address has been carefully analyzed and heavily scrutinized. Bush administration officials complained that the speech was overtly critical of the outgoing president. Obama's supporters called the address sobering and refreshingly honest. On this edition of Independent Sources, we talk with two journalists Christian who cover the, the inauguration about totally how they view the, the speech and the, the significance it had for their audiences. We look at the relationship between immigrants and African Americans, our common concerns fostering a new coalition, and we profile World Journal, a major Chinese language daily. But first, President Obama's inauguration address and how it was received in some ethnic communities here and in some other countries. Joining me is Abu Teher, executive editor of Bangla Patrika, a newspaper serving South Asian audiences. Also with me is Jean Combe de la Loire, editor in chief of France Amérique, a magazine serving the French community. Welcome. Abu, this election season, you've done it all. You were in New Hampshire covering that state's primary. Then you attended both the Democratic and the Republican National Convention. And recently you attended, you covered the uh, President Obama's inauguration uh, ceremony. And what kind of stories have you written out of this cycle and how were they received by your audience? We cover in, in the views of the, as an immigrant, you know, how the immigrant uh, people, they are responding, especially uh, is there any uh, story which is related to the immigration, which mm -hmm. is related with the immigrant people? Is there anything they will be interested? Is there anything which will serve their purpose, you know, whether they will benefit? So that kind of story we always look forward. Mm -hmm. And we found that the program he bring, like, you know, the the immigration policy, Obama, what he talked about. Right. And so those are the type of stories. You, you concentrate on immigration yeah. uh, for the most part. Jean, uh, you have a growing community uh, in the French uh, in New York. Uh, what kind of stories did you do? We did it in a very different way because uh, we started in Iowa to like covering the entire cycle from Iowa to the Indiana to the RNC to the inauguration and we mostly focused on specific issues. The, the thing is people are very puzzled but by what's coming now with the, uh, Obama, or they're expecting a lot and they wanted to understand uh, how far, I mean, where America was. And so we focused ma mainly on issues uh, concerning like people, their daily life. So we went to Pennsylvania and like started talking about the economic crisis and like how people suddenly started walking instead of taking the car to just to buy a gallon of milk, you know, because suddenly it was expensive to, to drive. We, we covered like um, uh, abortion, like because that's something that's very, very interesting for uh, Europeans. Mm -hmm. This all this kind of specific issues, like foreclosures in Denver. Suddenly, why, why are people losing their homes? What's happening? Mm -hmm. And so, to to try to bring a different vision of America, we we are the only one French-speaking magazine here in the U.S., and so we have an audience of Americans who wants to have a French view on U.S. politics and also French who wants to understand what's going on in America. So that's why we, we, we went down that route. Interesting. Now, one of the things that uh, President Obama did was remarkable during his inaugural address. He specifically mentioned Muslim as a group. Uh, let's look at this uh, tape. To the Muslim world, we seek a new way forward based on mutual interest and mutual respect. To those leaders around the globe who seek to sow conflict or blame their society's ills on the West, know that your people will judge you on what you can build, not what you destroy. Abu, that was remarkable. I mean, uh, how did that resonate in the Muslim community, that the fact that he mentioned Muslim? Uh, I think, you know, I mean, since September 11, uh, there is a lot of mis misunderstanding between Muslims and Western, Muslim world and Western world and terrorism and all these terms. And there is so many things going on. So uh, 
uh, and this is very important. I mean, in order to bring the peace and uh, destroy the uh, terrorism, the Muslim world is very important partner uh, if they take any kind of initiative. And I think Obama uh, realized that he needed a Muslim world, and that's what he mentioned in his speech, especially the Muslim world should be part of, you know, I mean, this is the new approach he bring to the mm -hmm. Muslim world. And I think the Muslim world also looking for someone who can understand them and, you know, they can close the gap between West and the Muslim world. And I think Obama did a perfect job in his speech that he addressed the Muslim world and Muslim world also hailed his, you know, whatever he talked about. Jean, in, in France, you have a large uh, Arab population, uh, most of them Muslim. Uh, is this going to improve Muslim-French relations, you think? It's, it's interesting. Before the election in October, we, we ran a story on how Barack Obama was perceived in the, the French suburbs, in the projects. And there was this, among bl black kids and Muslim kids from the, like, coming from, the parents coming from Algeria and, like, North Africa. North Africa. And there was a huge expectation, like, the, you know, the people wearing T-shirts, like, just, like, ident uh, like, kind of identifying with him. Yeah. And I think right now there are huge expectations in France among younger people. And this, he, he, he suddenly raised awareness or, like, expectation among those younger people, too, because we don't have a figure like this in, in France. And so I think he can do a lot to... to at l to bring America closer to, to French uh, among younger people in, in the project, yes. And, and I, I, also, uh, I also spoke to a few people who, are fr who was in an inauguration ceremony. They are the Muslims, and they are very excited about his approach, how okay. he approached the Muslim community. Now, another uh, element to this is he spoke about America's role in the world to lead again. Mm -hmm. Uh, again, let's watch uh, a comment from, from his speech. To all the other peoples and governments who are watching today, from the grandest capitals to the small village where my father was born, know that America is a friend of each nation and every man, woman, and child who seeks a future of peace and dignity. And we are ready to lead once more. Is America, or can America, or should America be the leader of the world uh, in this new world order that we live in? I mean, in a way, it's, it's needed. I mean, a leadership role is needed because if you look at what's going on, for example, in the Middle East, like in, in, the, in Gaza, or something, the, U, the European Com uh, Union like, is going to try, the French has, have been very active there like, to try to broker a deal. But if the U.S. is not taking part in it, the, the talks, are, you, you, you not, you're not going to get a result. So yes, a uh, leadership role is needed. And that's, what, that's, that's never been questioned, I think, by, by French authorities. They, there's, there's been a, 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 um, a desire to come closer to Washington, like the, what's happened with uh, Nicolas Sarkozy when he was elected, like to, to try to have a new relationship. But th the leadership role has never been que questioned, I think. Abu? Uh, you know, there is not only in Muslim world, there is in, uh, in European world, uh, also European community and uh, many countries in Europe, there is a lot of misunderstanding, uh, especially against the uh, American policy. And you see there is a huge demonstration all, all over the Europe sometimes against mm -hmm. the war and all this thing. And I think the Obama is the right person that when he came as a new, fresh leader and he approached all the worlds, including the European, that the America is for everyone. It's not like, you know, we should have any kind of enmity. We can work together. That's uh, the basic if, approach here. If I may add something, uh, there is this, this huge expectation of what he can bring. And it's probably Europeans are, might even be less realistic than Americans mm -hmm. on about what he, Barack Obama can change. You know, they, they, there's this expectation that he's going to change the U America, that he's, uh, he's going to be, you're going to see a, tr a dif different foreign policy, which I think is probably a bit far-fetched you know, because he's still... Uh, um, he has to look after so-called American interests. Exactly. And so uh, covering the inauguration, I, s I f found people there like very re realistic about the time it would take just to to change things, you know, like they were. They, they said, "Okay, 
is going to be is going to be needed like months or at least you know and if you look at the reaction of uh, on his speech like uh, the day after in the french press some of, uh, quite a few editorialists were like kind of a kind of not a, a little bit disappointed you know they expected like a, this grandiose speech or a, and and it was more realistic than what they would have liked to hear he can't meet all the expectations so we we'll, we're going to have to leave it at that uh, abu taher jean Combe de la loire thanks for being here now here's abby ishola with some other news Thanks, Gary. Here's a look at some headlines from New York's ethnic media. From El Diario La Prensa, the economic crisis has forced dozens of Central American immigrants in New Jersey to move into caves. Many of the occupants are illegal immigrants who've lost their jobs and are ineligible for unemployment benefits. They've nicknamed their makeshift home Devil's Cave and have been living there for three months. From the Irish Echo, there are concerns that a number of Catholic school closures in Brooklyn and Queens may affect demographics in areas that have traditionally been Irish and Italian enclaves. New York City recently approved plans to establish a publicly funded Hebrew school. The Jewish Forward reports that the Hebrew Language Academy Charter School will train students in both the language and Jewish culture. By law, the institution must be open to students of all ethnicities and exclude religious teachings. India Abroad reports that several new Jain temples have opened across the country over the past six months. The growth is partially a result of young priests attracting second and third generation Indian Americans. And finally, from the Filipino Reporter, President Barack Obama and First Lady Michelle Obama will keep White House Executive Chef Cristetta Comerford. Some advise the Obamas to replace the Filipino American chef with a high profile culinary artist, but former First Lady Laura Bush spoke highly of Comerford, prompting the Obamas to retain her. And those are just a few headlines from New York's ethnic media. Back to you, Gary. Thanks, Abby. Many ethnic groups are waiting for Barack Obama, the son of an African immigrant, to lay out his immigration policy. But the rights of immigrants have not always been high on the agenda for African Americans. In fact, immigrants and African Americans have at times been at odds. But these communities are now forming coalitions around common concerns. With me to talk about this topic is Ken Cohen, Regional Director of the NAACP. Also here is Angelo Falcon, President and Co-Founder of the National Institute for Latino Policy. Welcome. First, let's look at this report by Michel Garcia about the parallels some ethnic journalists are drawing between immigration raids and roundups and police behavior in black communities. On Long Island, a federal roundup of illegal immigrants is generating controversy. It's become a regular sight on the nightly news. Immigration agents raiding homes and workplaces, searching for undocumented immigrants. They violently, violently entered, the, entered the house and they broke two doors. And just a few months ago, the New York Times reported that some 60 immigrants have died in government detention. I have so many questions about Sandy's death. And ICE has made it so very difficult for me to learn what happened. Activists were soon linking the treatment of immigrants to the death of Sean Bell. For justice for Sean Bell. We have to be in the streets for justice for the raids and deportation of illegal immigrants. Sean Bell was shot 50 times outside of a nightclub by undercover police detectives. Bell was not armed and three officers were later acquitted. To the protesters, the links are simple. Whether they live here, legally or illegally, they are the victims of discrimination and prejudice. Writers and commentators have said the Bell story and the raids are linked by the thread of a larger issue, the use of force by government agents. Roberto Lovato, a writer for New America Media, the largest ethnic media alliance, quickly began making the connection on his blog of America and on television and radio programs. It's proving a thesis I've had for a while now, which is that the immigration raids, the attacks, uh, the increasing militarization of police forces, of uh, the National Guard at the border, are all indicators of how immigrants are being used to normalize having people with guns in our midst. New America Media published a separate commentary by Jean Demou. 
DeMoog compares the raids to an incident one September morning when federal agents swooped down on migrants living and working clandestinely. The year was 1851. The migrants escaped slaves. The place, Christiana, Pennsylvania. Later known as the Christiana tragedy when violence erupted as federal marshals attempted to round up their bounty for deportation to the south. For Independent Sources, I'm Michelle Garcia. Interesting piece, uh, African Americans and immigrants. For quite some time now, Ken, uh, some in the African American communities have viewed uh, immigrants suspiciously. Uh, as that view changed in recent years, where are we now? Well, let's, our communities are growing. Our, in many cases, our communities are changing. So we, we are living, <clears throat> we've always lived in, communi in diverse communities. Uh, and you know, when you talk about immigrants, it's hard to, to because everybody's an immigrant in this country. But African Americans. It's how, Americans. how they're seen. And now in the African American community, uh, it's been the practice to sort of try to separate. Uh, you have the, the the people from the islands, although we all look alike. They they, they, they nationalized in the '70s, right after the civil rights movement, where they 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 started identifying, you know, the Jamaicans and, and other groups, uh, just as they probably they did in the Latino communities. What we're seeing now, though, is is these different groups now mer coming back together for a common cause because we're all experiencing the same. Uh, we're understanding now that we're, we're we're part of the same struggle, again, and that in the past 40 years we've made advances, but then again we haven't made advances. So we're hoping now that we will see those changes. Are we seeing those changes from your perch, Angela? Well, we are and we aren't. I mean, right now with the um, with, with the new president, with Obama, I think there is a a lot of expectations about all sorts of changes, but also the racial dynamic in terms of how this country is looking at race is also changing in very interesting ways. And I think there's a feeling that there's certain sectors in the black community that are finally coming into their own. And that's important. Uh, we're seeing, for example, because Obama was black, all of a sudden uh, you see all these black commentators finally on TV. They were there all the time, but all of a sudden now they were discovered because there was a pressure now that you have a, a black candidate and a black president. So I think in the black community we're going to see some really good, positive changes in terms of uh, uh, seeing uh, the black community coming into more into its own politically and economically in this country. But there are all, se all other sectors in the black community that are not going to be benefiting from this. Um, and so there are a lot of uh, things that we share, but there are also a lot of differences. There are that feeling that there is competition between the right. communities for jobs. And, and by, by the way, there's some, even within the Latino community, some of that sentiment, that some of the newer immigrants are taking jobs. That's, that's going to be there. And with the economy, the way it's going, that's going to become a problem. The problem we have is that we don't have the leadership effectively framing the issue of working together uh, in, in a way that makes sense to people. To me, you know, instead of competition, what I see when we talk about blacks and Latinos and immigrants working together is the expanding of the constituency for a new civil rights movement. Uh, and that is something, a message that we have to get across. Exactly. What we're talking about is strengthening every sector, not competing. And sometimes we have some short-sighted leaders, some short-sighted people that do see it as a zero-sum game where we're basically competing with each other. And that's what we have to get over, and that's not going to be easy to do. Uh, but I, I think that's really the challenge for all of us. And how is the NWCP meeting that challenge? We've been working on several fronts. We're part of several different coalitions, uh, building bridges. Uh, uh, the Truth About Immigrants program, uh, my, my own particular branch, the Northeast Queens branch, working very hard in, in the Flushing area with, with the Asian community and the Latino community where we're talking, we're doing tough, like a tough love dialogue where we sit people in a room and we have some, some hard facts about what we feel about each other. And then we turn around and, and then look at how common, how, how, linked we are, we all have the same issues about each other. So therefore, why are we fighting each other? Instead of fighting each other, let's go back and, and, and address to the administration what changes we need to see to make our communities better, instead of mm -hmm. constantly having friction. Last week, thousands of people took to the streets across the country to demand immigration reform. Abby Ishola covered the march in New York. Let's watch. 
these immigration rights groups are asking for two things from newly elected President Barack Obama to stop deportation rates and to move towards a fair immigration reform. Mr. Obama made a promise during his campaign that he's going to reform the, the broken immigration system. We know that that is going to take time. So today we're asking signals of goodwill that he's committed with that promise. We basically uh, are seeing that our families, our communities are being torn apart by an immigration law that is unjust and that is broken, that is not working. Me and my wife working hard to support our family here. And by right now the government just tried to deport us. And our children, they are all U.S. born citizens. Don't they deserve right to stay with their parents? Most of these people have deep roots in this country because for the last three decades, they have been living as our neighbors. We can now really cut them off. Something has to be done. What do we want? Justice! When do we want Despite their cries, it may be some time before a comprehensive immigration reform is ironed out as the flagging economy is issue number one for President Obama. Abby Ashola for Independent Sources. I'd like to pick up on Abby's point about the challenges that uh, President Obama faces now. When you look at the economy, two wars, uh, where does immigration stand in his agenda, on his agenda? Well, you know, I, I think the uh, president, uh, you know, sometimes you feel sorry for the guy, but after all, he did run and he promised all these he things. He wanted so, the job. Yeah, he wanted right. the job. But I, I think the thing that, that's important is that this immigration issue is a very complicated one because one of the things, and not just immigration, issues of abortion, there are all a number of touchy issues that have in the past created this kind of pushback from the Republicans and more conservative sect that have killed any legislation. So the idea is that, I, as I see it, is that the Obama people and Obama are going to be thinking smart about this. He made certain promises. We see that administratively. There are a lot of things he could be doing around the driver's licenses, uh, around the raids that he could do without having to go to Congress. So that's the first thing that we're we're beginning to see little by little he's taking, he's moving on some of these things. Uh, in terms of the legislation in the Congress, we're hoping that he does begin to set up a situation where there is more bipartisan support uh, and that he can begin to set the stage for this comprehensive legislation. But it's going to take time. I think people need to keep pushing him, but at the same time people need to understand that they got to also work with him in a different kind of way and that this is the kind of issue that if it's presented in a premature way, it could just go down the tubes again. And we've seen that happen before. So I think uh, the challenges are not just, uh, you know, to me, I don't see a problem with Obama on principle supporting all of this stuff. The question is strategically, how is he you're going to mobilize and work with people in our communities to make it a, a legislative reality in terms of having comprehensive uh, immigration reform. Ken, so how can he do that? Uh, well, I, I think it's going to come back to us, the, the communities. We, we will have to put the pressures on those that we elect to represent us, especially down in Washington, and let the people do the talking. Uh, too many times there is a, a, a um, campaign waged by our, our leaders down in Washington. And then we are left sort of holding the bag because we, we get motivated and, and we're emotional about it. And then it doesn't, go our, it doesn't go the way we'd like to see it. And I think more of a groundswell must happen. I think that we, we really yeah. need to get this really going and then we can be successful. Yeah, to see how complicated it is, for example, look at uh, Governor Patterson's appointment of uh, this woman for the uh, Senate seat who basically has a terrible record on immigration issues. Right. And, you know, we need to hold now, it turns out we have to hold him accountable on this mm -hmm. one. And, and now some people are saying, look, when she is up for election, we're going to run against her. But it's, it's, that's how complicated it is. Right. Within our own ranks, within our own quite liberal ranks, and, and African-American mayor, I mean governor, <laughs> and he's, he's uh, putting somebody in there who's, you know, going against this agenda and, and complicating our, our politics in Washington. So it's complicated, but it's really the question right. of organizing uh, and then getting to the point in this country where I don't understand why people even listen to any of these Republicans anymore. Uh, but they, you know, they keep putting them on these shows and all these right wing people, you know, we have the hate speech problem. Right, right. There's an attitude in this country that's anti-immigrant that objectifies immigrants. And until we overcome that, and that's why this administration is going to be important because they're not going to be pushing those messages. We'll have to leave it at that. Ken Cohen, Angela Falcon, thanks for joining us. We'll be right back. You promised 
teach me the world. Is this what you had in mind? Every choice we make has a consequence. Help Earthshare and its members restore balance to the world. Visit earthshare.org and see what you can do. Earthshare, one environment, one simple way to care for it. We end our show with a profile of the World Journal, a leading Chinese language newspaper. The World Journal has been a newsstand for 30 plus years, and with more than a quarter million readers daily, it is one of the largest ethnic newspapers in the country. Zyphus LeBurn has more. Uh, they had pointed out Visitors to the World Journal can trace the paper's history through the plaques and pictures that line the office walls in Queens. This is um, the founder, right. and T.W. Wong. This is our current president, my father, Howard Lee. Tina Lee is the executive vice president of the journal and boasts that its 400,000 readership makes it the largest Chinese paper in the United States. That's a long way from February 1976, when her grandfather, along with a group of newly emigrated Chinese journalists, published the first issue. He came to the U.S. and he saw that the papers that were being published here, what they did was they would mail over the newspapers um, from Asia and then they would cut out the old articles and then paste them onto the page and then, you know, um, photograph that and print that again. So by the time the news came, it was really old news. Since then, the World Journal has grown from a 12-page black and white spread printed only in Mandarin in New York to a sprawling 120 pages that is printed in two dialects and distributed all over the United States and online. Was it initially both in Chinese and in English, or was it always...? No, uh, always in Chinese. We do have uh, some translations of New York articles mm -hmm. in English on the website, okay. but primarily it's in Chinese. Okay. Lee attributes much of the journal's success to thorough and more objective reporting than its competitors. I think the loyalty of the readers comes from the fact that they feel our news is objective, they can trust what we report. And second, to the paper's outreach beyond the Chinese community. That includes raising over $2 million for UNICEF and the Red Cross, and sponsoring an award for mainstream journalists that was named after her grandfather. This was after the Winholi incident. We wanted to recognize mainstream journalists and English publications that um, reported about um, China or Chinese American issues. Even with the World Journal's successes, the paper still finds room for improvement. Lee hopes that despite being undermanned, with a current staff of nearly 80 reporters and editors, the journal can eventually do more in-depth feature pieces that offer a more complete view of the Chinese community. Outside of the community, one of the things that are happening is there's more recognition of the activism and that Asians are willing to be heard, wanting to be heard, as opposed to the perception before that Asians are sort of quiet and they just go about their business. That's our show. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you again next week. In the meantime, be independent-minded.